It's an honor to have Secretary Schultz with us at an Actera event. George P. Schultz is a great American. He served as a Marine in World War II. In a civilian career that has spanned 70 years, he's held leadership positions in business, government, and academia. He worked in the Eisenhower, Nixon, and Reagan administrations, and he's one of only two individuals in the history of the United States to serve in four cabinet positions. He's currently Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. And before we get started, on behalf of Actera and everyone here, I want to thank you for your service to our country. We're going to get to the carbon tax proposal very soon, but before we do, I'd like to ask Secretary Schultz to give us some historical context. You played a crucial role in recommending to President Reagan that the United States sign the Montreal Protocol, the international agreement that phased out chlorofluorocarbons, which were depleting the ozone layer. Tell us about that experience and the lessons that we can apply today. I think there are lots of lessons. Here's what happened. <clears throat> there were a fairly significant number of top flight scientists who thought the ozone layer was depleting. There were some who doubted it. But they all agreed that if it happened, it would be a catastrophe. I had twice a week private meetings with President Reagan, and we talked about it quite a bit. And he became convinced that the scientists who were worried were right. But then he didn't do what people do now. Nowadays, you, the people you don't agree with, you try to abolish them, and damn them, and have a big fight with them. That's the way we did business in the Reagan administration. He put his arm around them and said, OK, we, you don't agree with us on this. We respect that. We respect you're wrong. But you do agree if it happened, it will be a catastrophe. So why don't we take out an insurance policy? Insurance policy is an appealing concept. You don't take out an insurance policy because you expect your house to burn down, but you take it just in case. So that didn't get them with us, but it did, got them off our back. And then it turned out, as often happens in the United States, when there is a uh, really important problem coming up, the creative instincts uh, kick in. And in this case, the DuPont Company came up with something you could do, not something you aspire to 10 years from now, something you could do today. So we got that around and people doing it, and eventually an agreement to do it worldwide called the Montreal Protocol. And that is the one big environmental treaty that clearly worked. And I think in retrospect, most of the people involved would agree that the scientists who were worried were right, and the Montreal Protocol came along just in time. So I believe there is an important lesson there. That is where we have our climate change issue. It's much more complex than the ozone layer, but a lot of similar characteristics in that <clears throat> there are people who apparently think the climate isn't changing. I think they're going to be mugged by reality. In fact, they are by this time. But at any rate, there's arguments about why. And in light of the clear consequences, I say, let's put the insurance policy idea out there and say, let's do some things just in case. And if you do them, oftentimes you get additional benefits. For example, I have supported and we have a lot, a lot of energy R&D going on now for the last maybe eight years. And I, I see it at MIT where I chair their advisory committee on their energy initiative and I see it at Stanford and elsewhere. <clears throat> and it's really astonishing how much has been achieved. The 
Solar energy is much less expensive now than it was. Wind energy is much less expensive. Batteries are getting better all the time. There's a Chevy that uh, they say will go 230 something miles between charges now. And the battery people over at Stanford that I talked to, like Steve Chu and another fellow, they say the battery is going to get sharply better fairly quickly. They're going to be lighter, they're going to have longer range, and so on. So I say the electric car is here. And there are many other examples of things that have come out of this research that are very positive, so I think it should be kept going. It's interesting that the federal government support is very small, but it stands for the fact that there's a program there. And it's never at MIT and probably other places, but I just know about those. The private money is three times the government money. Because private companies that are in this business say, something's going on, we want to know what's going on, and so we'll be part of it. And we say, that's great, because if we think of something, these are the people who know how to commercialize it and know how to scale it. So it's fine, it's a good deal. So. I think in the Montreal Protocol case, what I learned from it is do some research and think about the insurance policy concept. You don't have to run over the people who don't agree with you. You can persuade them. It's possible to persuade people. I've done it a lot. It works. <laughs> you wouldn't know it these days, but it works. <laughs> Secretary Schertz, you, you made the observation that the climate change problem is a lot more complicated than the ozone hole was. What will it take, given the different energy profiles of countries around the world, to develop comprehensive solutions to greenhouse gas emissions? Well, obviously, it's the kind of problem, just as the ozone layer was, that you have to approach on a global basis. And there are more and more countries around the world that are doing things. We had a big meeting at uh, Hoover the other day on what China is doing. China is trying to get to a cap and trade system. Personally, I think it's very inferior to a carbon tax. That would be a big argument with them. But anyway, they're moving. And Europe has moved. India is. You go to India or China these days. I don't know how many people have been to India or China recently. Hold up your hands. You know, you can hardly breathe, right? The air is so polluted, so you don't have to persuade them that something needs to be done. Obviously, it needs to be done. So I think that uh, the global uh, effort needs to be made, and it's ripe. In the proposal we have for a revenue neutral carbon tax, we also propose to put an import tax on carbon that's coming in and what, whatever import we have. and then say, and that would go into the pot that gets distributed. But say to the country, if you don't like the import tax, put a revenue to carbon tax and you get rid of it. So we have a concept of trying to get global attention. But I think there is a lot of global attention. What's your impression of the Paris Climate Accord? <clears throat> and do you agree with Secretary of State Tillerson's comment in his confirmation hearing that it's critical the US remain at the table take part in the international process? You know, I think it's, a, it's an accord that acknowledges the fact that this is a global effort, and everybody has to step up. People say, well, there are no requirements in it. That's true. Uh, and so some people say, well, we could get rid of it, and we wouldn't be doing anything. I don't think that's true at all. The United States has to take leadership. People look to us for leadership. And this is just one more example of it. Uh, do you expect the U.S. to stay in the Paris Accord from what you've read in your contacts with the new administration? I don't have much in the way of contacts, so I, don't ha I can't uh, say. But so far, so good. And Secretary of State Tillerson has been very direct in his statements on this. When you visit Washington, how do you explain your concern for climate change, especially to people who still question the underlying science? Well, I try to break the subject down. The first question is, is the climate changing? 
And <clears throat> I say, if you don't like the science, which I think is compelling, or measurements of heat, there's a new ocean being created in the Arctic. How come? And the sea ice is melting faster all the time. How come? The ice cap over Greenland is melting fast. How come? In West Antarctica, there are big sheaves of ice falling off and going into the ocean. How come? And when, these, when, the, uh, when a new ocean is being created from the melting of sea ice, that doesn't have much impact on the sea level, but the other things do. And these are giant developments. So it's happening. It's an observation. Now, why? Well, people argue about that. I think there is a concept, and there's quite a lot of evidence that carbon is a main culprit. Um, people who don't agree, I, I say, well, you know, what, what about an insurance policy? An insurance policy isn't that tough. What is it? Number one, keep energy R&D going. That's going well. It's not that expensive to do. And you get first class scientists and engineers working on it, and you get results. So do that. And then put into effect a revenue neutral carbon tax. And we have been campaigning for that now, and we have a pretty good thrust at the moment on this subject. And we say, you're all complaining that the EPA is telling you do this, do that, and so forth. OK, let's get rid of all that stuff and just put a price out there and let the market sort it out. But put all the sources of energy on the same playing field. And if you are a source of energy that pr contributes carbon to the atmosphere, you pay a tax. If you don't, you don't. So it's a level playing field and let the market sort it out. And what are the main arguments in your view for why this is a better way to deal with it than other approaches that have been proposed? Well, the approach of regulatory uh, matters, I think, is kind of broad and also not as effective as a tax. It doesn't promote innovation and creativity. If you put a price out there, we're all accustomed to seeing markets work and people react and they get creative about it. So let, them, let, let people figure out what they want to do instead of telling them. I think it's a much better way to go. I also think a tax is better than a cap and trade system, which we have in California. Because the cap and trade system, the price goes up and down all the time, depending on how many credits there are out there. And it also tends to have the creation of credits. In the case of the European cap and trade system, I think it's a fair statement. That's become very corrupted. By many of these credits are not, they're fraudulent. So it's better to just put a tax out there, and there it is, and you have to react to that. And explain to us how the uh, revenue neutral aspect of this works. Uh, you've said it's, it's a tax, but it's also, there's a dividend component, which sounds like could be one of the political appeals of this approach. Well, our view, and there are many, but our view is let it be administered by an existing bureaucracy so you don't create something new. And there is a bureaucracy that for years has done a good job of taking money in and paying it out. It's called the Social Security Administration. That's what they do. They take in money and they pay it out. So let them be the administrator and let the fund grow and let it be publicly visible all the time. Everybody can see how much is in it. And then periodically, like once a quarter, you pay it out and you pay it out in an equal amount to everybody who has a social security number. So that means it's a, not a, it's a progressive tax. And also it means that every so often you get a little check in the mail that says, here's your carbon dividend. Not bad. You don't want to lose that. 
Tell us about the work of the Climate Leadership Council that I know has been advocating for a proposal that you just described. And what's been your involvement in this new organization? Well, we have, gradually, we've had individuals join us, <clears throat> wide range. We've tried to start by keeping it Republican, uh, try to hit Republicans, but more and more Democrats want to sign on, and so we're saying, okay. Like, for instance, Larry Summers has joined. Um, but uh, now we're trying to get businesses to join. Um, Rob Walton, who's one of the owners of Walmart, is one of our people. That's the biggest employer in the country, so that stands for something. And we're, I think we're going to sign up quite a few companies. There are lots of companies now that price carbon into their long-range investment plans. They just assume there's going to be a price on it and it's there. So I think this is spreading. So we're trying to build a big coalition and have that be a way of advocating that Congress enact this. From your experience in government, Secretary, how long might it take for a consensus to develop in Washington that carbon tax is a good way to go? And what political constituencies would need to join for this to become a reality? Well, it's been a quarter century since I was in Washington as Secretary of State. But I served in the Eisenhower administration. Everybody liked Ike. And everybody trusted Ike. Trust is the coin of the realm in these things. And he did what he said he was going to do, and he could carry things out. So people trusted him. And I think the same was true. I mean, Nixon has a bad rap right now, but he did a lot of terrific things. And um, I mean, it wasn't just the uh, open to China, but <clears throat> I was involved in quite a few things, for example. Nixon was the one who led the desegregation of schools in the seven southern states. And this was, I think, 16 years after the Brown decision. So it was very touchy to do it, but he did it. I chaired the, um, the group that did, carried it out for him. So I knew and worked with him on that. So <clears throat> you have that, and then, of course, Ronald Reagan, he was masterful. And you do little things like, for instance, there's a, a nice theater in the White House. So the Reagans would get a good movie, and they'd get a starlet or two to come, and they'd invite people to come for the show, sit around, talk, become friends. Nothing heavy, but we, we become friends, and we trust each other. So we can then call each other up and get somewhere. In the State Department, there's a nice dining room. So I could invite three or four couples to come and have dinner. And then you can get the presents box at the Kennedy Center anytime you want, go and see a show, and just talk and become friends and get where you trust each other. That's the way you build a relationship and build an ability to make agreements on one thing or another. So. I, that seems to be a lost art right now, but maybe it'll come back. I know we all hope it will. If I can just drill down a little more, when you think about the political constituencies that would have to get behind a carbon tax, uh, you spoke of engaging large companies in your coalition, and I imagine at some point unions and other organizations would need to sign on as well. Um, again, from how you've seen policy develop, uh, in your professional life, what would it take for this to all come together? And are we looking at five years, 10 years, or sooner than that, the urgency demands it? Well, I think sooner than that, but for instance, one of our key supporters is Mike Bloomberg. And Mike has, runs a very successful company. He has a major philanthropic operation, and he was for 12 years mayor of New York City. So he knows something about politics and he has funds to devote to things. Mike thinks that the way to go, or among the ways to go, is to go to cities and localities. 
and uh, cities can do things and they can build on that. I have a granddaughter who's working for the found his foundation mm -hmm. and they went to Paris. And if you're working with Mike Bloomberg, you can take over the Louvre and have a party. <laughs> or you can get the mayor's office and have a party. So Mike is a good guy to work with. And he's, <laughs> he's, well, he's very uh, uh, smart, obviously, and, and um, um, he's the kind of person who will get something done. Seventeen Republican members of Congress recently endorsed a resolution in support of conservative environmental stewardship and urged the government to develop economically viable solutions to climate change. How significant is this development and do you envision more Republicans joining on to such efforts? Well, we've written it up. We've called it a conservative case. Uh, and we're trying to argue that here you are objecting to all the government telling you do this, do that, and do the other thing. Why don't we get rid of that and just put a price out there? That should appeal to Republicans. It's the market. Use the marketplace. And I think it will work better. So we, we make that argument all the time. But uh, that, that doesn't mean we aren't interested in having Democrats support us. We just think that, that probably they will because they seem to be more oriented to this subject. How important is California's leadership and that of other states who are working on this? Well, I think it's uh, very important that the constituencies, cities, states are taking on problem, taking on this issue and making important strides on it. And I think California has actually accomplished quite a lot. I don't like the cap and trade system anywhere near as the revenue neutral carbon tax. It doesn't work as well as a, as a system. And also it lends itself to somebody taking the money and using it for something that isn't necessarily popular. And that if it isn't popular, that tends to drain away support. Like Jerry is using the money for supporting the high speed rail because he can't get any other way to support it. <laughs> Uh, let's talk for a minute about some of the innovations that you're uh, following as chair of the MIT and Stanford Energy Committees. Uh, news came out yesterday that Tesla stock is now worth more than Ford Motor Company. Um, tell us from your perspective when you're seeing the innovation happening at these two great universities, are we likely to see more companies like this forming that become uh, extremely valuable in the way that Tesla has? Well, Tesla is a good example of an electric car maker. <clears throat> but it's also interesting to me that Chevrolet has a car out called the Bolt that um, they say will go 230 something miles between charges. So that takes the range anxiety away. But the people at Stanford that I know who work on batteries, like Steve Chu, say the batteries are going to get sharply better over the next three or four years. They're going to be lighter. They're going to have more of a charge and so on. Everything about them is going to get better. So I say the electric car is here. And uh, it's going to be competitive economically. And uh, it's helped. Now, let me give you an example. I have had solar powers panels on my house on the Stanford campus for about six years or so. I've long since paid for them by the amount I've saved on my electric bill. And I drive a Chevy Bolt around. And <clears throat> the panels, the electric panels produce more electricity than my Bolt uses. So what's my cost of fuel? Zero. Zero. What's not to like? <laughs> <laughs> In two days, President Trump is meeting with President Xi in Florida, and I imagine climate change will be one of the topics that comes up. If you were advising the president today, how would you recommend he address this? Well, President Xi seems to have the message that there's a problem and China has to do something about it. We had a big meeting at Hoover a couple of weeks ago with representatives from China and people around. 
arguing. I have made a big thing about a carbon tax is better than a cap and trade system, but they are moving. And they are, I think, aware of the seriousness of the issue, in part because they can see it and feel it in their cities. Um, so I think President Xi will uh, be on that side. I had a meeting with him once. Henry Kissinger has put together, and he and I have worked on it together, what's called a track two with China. That is, people who were in office once but aren't now, and they meet together. And you're, you're not speaking for the government. You can be a little looser and probe into things. So we have that uh, going. And before President Xi was president, but he was known to be about to become president, he had a dinner for us in the state guest house. And he gave a talk, Henry gave a talk, and then he sat next to me. And I knew that he was going to Washington. That had been made known. So I said to him, on your way to Washington, why don't you stop in San Francisco? I said, we have a Chinese-American mayor. He's doing a good job. He'll be well received. And he said, I can't do it because I've already agreed to stop in Los Angeles. <laughs> but he said, if I came that way, what I'd really like to do is come to Stanford because there's something going on around there. And the only way to really feel it is to go there and talk to people and get some sense of what's taking place. So I was fascinated that he knew that and also that he knew <clears throat> that you can't find out about things just by reading. <clears throat> you gotta come somehow and meet people and talk to people and get a human feeling. <clears throat> Very good. Um, but I imagine in their talk, there'll be a lot of talk about North Korea. Mm -hmm. That's topic A. Any personal impressions of him that, for, for those of us who know very little about his relatively new leader, just his style, his uh, how he may relate to issues like climate change from what you observed? What I observed about him is that he is a person who is ready to engage. And I remember in my own case, when I took office, I thought our relations with China were a little shaky. So I went over with the presence, uh, okay, and I said to them, you put on the table everything you want to talk about. I'll put on the table everything I want to talk about. We'll make an agenda out of that. I'll agree to come here once a year. You, Wu Chi Chen, who was my partner, but Deng Xiaoping was involved, to come to the US once a year, and we meet at, at international meetings about three or four times a year, and so every time we had one, let's take about three hours and set it aside just for us to talk. And having an agenda, staff can work on the agenda. And they loved it. We worked through it, and it worked well. So I think something like that will help. But here's a story that's distressing, but I know it's true. Do you remember the Sunnyland Summit? The Southern President California. In Southern California, that was at the old Annenberg Estate. It was two or three years ago. President Obama met with President Xi at Sunny Maid. That's right. But President Xi sent a message before saying he wanted to come a day early and bring his wife. In other words, he's saying, I want to get to know you so we can have a kind of friendship. We can learn how to talk candidly about subjects. My wife, Charlotte, who probably some of you know, she's chief of protocol in San Francisco and California. So she gets a SOS call from the State Department. We should go down to Orange County and help out. So she goes. There is no high federal official at the airport to meet the incoming president of China. Nobody. So, and the First Lady sends word she can't come at all because it's the birthday of one of her children, which turned out to be the following week. Mm. So she sends an SOS to Jerry Brown that we know well, and Jerry comes with Ann, so somebody's there. Then the President of China cools his heels. My wife entertains the First Lady. I said, what's she like? Oh, she's a beautiful woman. She's fun. She's stylish. She's interested in everything. 
She has an operatic quality voice. They have to keep her appearances on the stage down or she'd be more popular than her husband. <laughs> <laughs> but we're a winner. So what a missed opportunity. Because the way you, the way you figure out how to work with somebody and develop a program of some kind is you get to know them and be friends. So you trust each other. And having the wives involved makes it better. Uh, and particularly a star like the president of China's wife, from what my wife says. So that's a terrible missed opportunity, but it also tells you that he has an instinct for how to work with people. So I'm glad that he is, it's a big thing for him to agree to come here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a big deal. And I hope that this discussion goes well. I'm gonna open up to audience questions in just a minute, but one, one more question, and I have a sense from your story that this might relate to uh, what, what I would like to explore is, how did you serve in so many high profile roles in government, business, and academia, and have people of all political backgrounds admire and respect you? Well, I just did, but I didn't have an ambition to do anything. I wanted to be, when I came home from the Marine Corps at the end of World War II, I learned, I might say I learned a lot of the Marine Corps. For example, in Marine Corps boot camp at the beginning of the war, Sergeant hands me my rifle. He says, take good care of this rifle. This is your best friend. And remember one thing, never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull a trigger. No empty threats basic Marine Corps. I told that story to President Reagan once, and he, he said, yeah, that's what we're going to live by. If somebody was sitting in a situation room, somebody says, that's unacceptable. He said, what are you going to do if it happens? Nothing. Well, then it's not unacceptable. You accepted it. <laughs> so you have, you have to be willing to do something. There has to be follow through. So I learned that in the Marine Corps. And then I learned my outfit went overseas, and one day I'm tapped on the shoulder, and I'm up in a little island called Funafuti, and I'm a second lieutenant. I don't know what's going on, but there's ships everywhere, Marines everywhere, something's going to happen. Turned out to be the Toronto operation, which was a big deal. <clears throat> I got tapped on the shoulder and said, Lieutenant, you can take your platoon, get on a destroyer, you're going to go up to a little island called Nanamea. It's lightly held by the Japanese. Land before day, daybreak. Take the island, and then we'll come, and we'll set up a medevac setup. So we get on our destroyer, and we go up, and we disembark into the little boats. And of course, the tide is out. So the boats can't get anywhere near the shoreline. We have to get in the way. To, and it's a coral underpinning. So that you can put your foot in the wrong place, and you go down. We're holding our rifles up. And finally, we make it into shore. <clears throat> By this time, it's daylight. And there's some natives on the shore. And one of them has a white robe on. So I go up to him, and I learned a little Polynesian. As I said to him, Talofa Soli, meaning good morning, sir. He looked me over carefully, and he said, good morning, Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> We have been expecting you. The Japanese left two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> However, the Japanese were back by noontime, bombing, strafing. Mm -hmm. And the only building on the island of any significance was a church with big, thick walls. So the planes come and somebody yells out, church. I yell out, disperse, which we did. And the Japanese put a bomb in the dead center of that church. So I said to my guys afterwards, uh, don't enter us today if you're enemy. They're pretty good marksmen. And number two, don't do what they expect you to do. But they came back. And I had a sergeant named Patton, who was a terrific guy. You know, you get close to people. And, and uh, I mean, if you ask Jim Mattis today, who was a great Marine, he said, who do you listen to, Jim? He said, I listen to the sergeants because that's the upward communication. So 
it was early in our wartime experience, that little combat going on, so I was looking for him. I said, I ran over to where they might be, and I said, where the hell is Patton? Patton's dead, sir. So suddenly the reality of war sinks in. Wonderful people get killed, injured. And so if you ever have a chance to be close to a president and decide whether to send people into conflict, be careful. Be sure you have a good mission. Be sure people are equipped to achieve what they set out to achieve. You don't go there just to go there. You get there to achieve something. And so in the Reagan administration, we were very careful in our use of force. Hardly any. Sure. Not just me, who was the president, of course. There's very good advice that I hope the new administration hears in, in some form. Uh, I want to open it up. But you've got to have strength. And Reagan was very strong. For example, early in his time in office, the air controller struck. Maybe you remember that. Mm -hmm. And he said, they took an oath of office. They violated it. They're out. And all over the world, people said, my God, is he crazy? He's the guys that keep the planes fine. But he had, as Secretary of Transportation, a man who had been chief executive of a major transportation company. So he understood the problem. And being a chief executive, he knew how to get things done. And working with the president, they initially manned the towers with management people and I think some military people. And they had an aggressive recruiting and training program, and they kept planes flying. So all over the world, people said, hey, watch your step, the guy plays for keeps. So you establish that fact. And then the Soviets had something called intermediate range nuclear missiles. And their diplomatic ploy was they had these missiles that could hit European targets, that could hit Japan, could hit China, but not us. And their diplomatic ploy was to say, would the United States risk using its intercontinental missiles to retaliate, knowing that we would then retaliate against them? That was what they were trying to do, divide us. So we had got an agreement in NATO that we would have a negotiation and our position was zero on each side. People said, that's a crazy position. They have 1,500 deployed. We had none. But that's what we wanted. So <clears throat> we'd have a negotiation. If we couldn't get anywhere in the negotiation, then we would deploy intermediate range missiles in Europe. And we had these negotiations. And President Reagan was a, he's a smart bargainer. And he realized he wasn't just bargaining with the Soviets. He was bargaining with the European publics that they were convinced our negotiations were, non, were a real effort. So when the Soviets shot down a Korean airliner, we led the charge in condemning them internationally. But we also sent our arms control negotiators back to Geneva, which broke with the concept of linkage that was long in place. At any rate, the negotiations didn't work out, so we deployed cruise missiles in Britain with Margaret Thatcher's help. Same in Italy with Andriotti's help. And then came the big deal, ballistic nuclear missiles in Germany that the Soviets thought could hit Moscow. And they raised hell. War talk was planned. They walked out of the negotiations. Our alliance held together. We deployed the missiles. And in my opinion, that was the turning point in the Cold War, but no shot was fired, but it was strength. And as time went on that year, things began to soften up. And by August, I was able to go to the president and say, Mr. President, at four different cities in Europe, a Soviet diplomat has come up to one of ours at a cocktail party and said virtually the same thing, which we think comes down to if Gromyko, their foreign minister, is invited to Washington. When he comes to the General Assembly in September, he will accept. In other words, the Soviets blinked. And I said, Mr. President, maybe you want to think this over because 
President Carter stopped those talks when they invaded Afghanistan, and they're still there. He said, I don't have to think it over. Let's get them here. So he came. It was a big deal. Nancy Reagan was my pal. She always fixed me up with a starlet at White House dinners. I got to dance with Ginger Rogers. And so I went to Nancy. I said, Nancy, what's going to happen is you're going to come into the Oval Office. We'll have a meeting. Then we'll all walk down the colonnade to the mansion. That's your home. And there's some stand around time, and then there'll be a working lunch. So I said, what if you came to the stand around time, and you're the hostess. It'd be a nice touch. So she said, OK. As soon as Gromyko is a very smart diplomat, as soon as he sees Nancy, he knows that she is influential. He makes a beeline for her. It's like nobody else is in the room. And before long, he says to her, does your husband want peace? Nancy could bristle. She says, of course, my husband wants peace. And Gromyko says, well, then every night before he goes to sleep, whisper in his ear, peace. <laughs> so, so he's a little taller than she was. So she put his hands on his shoulder, and he pulled him down. So he had to bend his knee. And then she said, I'll whisper in your ear, peace. I said, Nancy, you just won the Cold War. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I know the world is a more peaceful place because of your leadership and diplomacy. Let me open it up to questions. There are some microphones that are floating around. Um, and I'm going to ask you, in the interest of letting Secretary Schultz answer as many questions as he can this evening, to keep them to 30 seconds or less. Before you start that, I have two things. Yeah. In your annual report, you talk about big things, but also little things. People can do stuff, particularly on energy efficiency. And we published a book not long ago. Jim Sweeney wrote it. We published it at Hoover on energy efficiency. And there are charts in here about the difference that's made. It's huge, huge. It adds up to a lot. So I'm presenting you with this book. Thank you very much. And I mentioned the Game Changer meetings we had with MIT. We had one here, and then we had one back at MIT. And then Bob Armstrong, who succeeded earning when he is at MIT, and I wrote this book called Game Changers. So I'll give you that. Thank you very much. This will be. Got a question in the back there. Thank you very much, Secretary Schultz. Uh, in terms of the carbon tax that you've proposed, the revenue neutral one, sorry about the feedback. Um, how would you go about setting the price for that tax? And in particular, how would you go about changing the price over time, depending upon how the climate re responds to the tax? Well, we would want to set a good price that catches people's attention. In our little write-up, we propose $40 a ton. But we think if we get this, it should be then raised like $10 a year legislatively, not a decision, built into the law for three or four years and then stop and evaluate where you are. So that's where we stand on the price. And we think it should be levied at the source, so to speak. That is, at the refinery level, the mine level, or wherever the source of energy is coming from. Much more efficient to do it like that. Question uh, here in the front. Hi. Uh, thank you for the uh, this event, as former Secretary of State. Um, what? Would there be a differentiation in terms of the tax rate as in, I know that certain gases like methane are believed to have a greater effect on the, have a, or a greater contribution to the greenhouse effect. Would there be a different tax rate for say methane that's released into the air versus, um, you know, say coal? Well, we basically thought if you put a price out there and it covers and not try to have different prices for different things. Maybe you should, but it's an added complexity. And to get it across, keep it as simple as possible. So I understand your point, but that's why we've done it. Question? Yes, sir. 
Secretary Schultz, thank you so much. And I look, I fondly look back on when you were secretary during the Reagan years, and there was the ability for Democrats and Republicans to come to agreement. And my big concern, I, I totally agree with what you're saying in terms of the carbon tax, but my big concern is not just the inability for Democrats and Republicans to agree, but when you look at conservative principles and what I see generally out there and people I've personally interacted with is a general hostility to science. And how do you deal with the fact that there is a, a decent percentage of people in Washington who are openly hostile to what the scientific evidence is telling us? What you do is talk to people. In the Reagan years, our motto was, if you want me in with you on the landing, include me in the takeoff. So we reached out to people all the time, as in the Montreal Protocol. So I think you have to reach out and talk to people and develop decent relationships with them so you can have a conversation. And you can talk about the science, but you can also talk about the realities. As I said earlier, there's a new ocean being created. Greenland's losing its ice cap. These are factual matters that you can bring forward, and, and there's no other explanation than that it's getting warmer. <coughs> and so you can d discuss these things and talk about them and make friends with people. That's the way you, that's the way you do it, at least. That's, in my experience, that works. And I had experiences in that as Secretary of Labor and Treasury, the OMB, and I also, people are, are after you all the time, the Republicans, uh, they don't do anything about the environment. I say, wait a minute. The first bill environmentalist was Teddy Roosevelt, Republican. Who did the Montreal Protocol? President Reagan, a Republican. Who did the cap and trade system that did in the, the uh, acid rain issue? George H.W. Bush, a Republican. Who created the EPA? Nixon, a Republican. So I say, well, if you want a lot of talk, get a Democrat. If you want to get something done, get a Republican. <laughs> okay. Very good. Uh, yes. Thank you, Secretary Schultz. Do you agree with comment that I heard a couple of weeks ago from David Brooks? that by the United States and the current administration saying, okay, we'll go back to coal and various, and we'll pull out of, you know, we'll ignore these various things that we're basically allowing or encouraging China to do all the research and all the solar and every, all those innovations will occur there rather than here in the United States. Well, China is building coal plants, but less so. In the, the case of the United States, I don't think there have been any coal plants built in a while. And it's been supplanted by gas. And that has been happening, and it's one of the reasons why our record on emissions has been pretty good in the last six or seven years. I don't know if you've ever seen a coal plant. When I, I was in a company called Bechtel, we built things. And we, I remember we built a coal plant once. It is a giant undertaking. You have to have a place for the coal to come. You have to have all kinds of conveyors to get it in to be burned and so on. Gas plant is like nothing. You bring your pipeline, zoop, it's done. And it's cheaper now. So the reason why we have less coal, more gas, is it's cheaper. The economics make sense. So I say, if you want to reach out to coal miners, which I think is a reasonable thing to do, then reach out to them as people and say, coal is dying for economic reasons, and we want to help you adjust. And maybe there's some educational things that can be done. Maybe there's some mobility. Maybe we won't want to. But we ought to help these people adjust because they're out of a job. Yes, hand up here. 
Yes. Thank you, uh, Secretary Schultz, for all your service. Speak louder. Thank you, Secretary Schultz, for all your service. Mm -hmm. I heard you talk briefly on a forum, and I was disappointed that you spoke of supporting the Keystone Pipeline and the DAPL Pipeline. From my perspective, we're really, really running out of time when we have to get off of carbon energy. Um, we've added 90 parts per million in the last 60 years, and it took 6,000 years coming out of the Ice Age to add 90 parts per million. So we're running 100 times faster than a very fast geological time. In the next 30 years, we'll add another 90 parts per million carbon dioxide. This is not sustainable. What can we do to, to why do you support DAPL? Why do you support the Keystone Pipeline? Those are terrible sources of carbon. And if we build the infrastructure to, to use those, we commit the planet to more and more carbon dioxide, and that could do us in. Well, it's a result of my experience. When I was Secretary of Labor in 1969, the President made me chairman of a cabinet committee on the oil import program. At that time, President Eisenhower had thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we used, we were asking for trouble. So there's a quota system. And we were being to bump up against it. That was the reason. So we studied that. And we made some, I thought, fairly obvious recommendations. We said, the vulnerability is not a war. The vulnerability is a, the turmoil in the Middle East. And that's where a lot of the oil comes from. So we ought to minimize our um, imports from there. We said, we're, we've been working at this for a few months. And by this time, we know more about the subject than anybody else in the federal government. Energy is a strategic resource. There ought to be some organization in the government that's keeping track and paying attention. And then we said the quota system provides the rents to the Saudi Arabians. Why don't we do a tariff system and we can achieve the same result and we'll get the rents. And we had, I don't know, we said we ought to have a storage system as an insurance policy. And we, the report was published. The president patted me on the head and said, thank you for a nice report. There were congressional hearings. Nothing happened. Nothing. So uh, I had to conclude that if you want to get something to happen, a strategic analysis is not enough. You really got to get in there. Then, as I said earlier, I'm director of the Office of Management Budget, and the EPA gets created. And I was fascinated that a lot of the bright young people that worked for me on the oil import program came over and they said, we'd like to work for the EPA. Why? Because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Our lakes and our streams are polluted, and we, it's not that hard to clean them up, and we ought to be doing that. We want to do it. And we want to be sure that the air in our city stays decent, and so on. So I was impressed with the environmental side of things. Then I become Secretary of the Treasury. And here comes the Arab oil boycott. At that time, there was a lot of electricity produced by oil. So Christmas lights were discouraged. Gas stations closed on weekends. It was a giant event. So I say to myself, and then I have the Montreal Protocol experience. I say to myself, in the energy field, you have to keep your mind, in your mind security, economics, and the environment. The minute you turn your back on one of those, you're in trouble. So as far as I can see, what we get from Canada is secure. And so that has a lot to be said for it. We can do, we'd, we need to have a program that maintains our security. We need to have one that provides cheap energy so our economy can flourish. But at the same time, we have to pay more and more attention to the environment. So that's why I've been advocating a revenue neutral carbon tax. Thank you. Question in the back there. Yes. Secretary Schultz, you've been talking about the revenue neutral carbon tax as a nationwide thing 
if it was easier to get it passed on a statewide basis, would that make sense as a, a program to do it initially in states and then eventually nationwide? Sure, it'd be great. Uh, anybody that can do it. I, I wish California would uh, change its cap and trade system to a tax system. And maybe that can happen because there's going to be, I think in 2020, there's a critical moment right. of some kind. And <clears throat> so we're starting to beat that drum. But, but I, if, if I can't have a revenue neutral carbon tax, I'll take a cap and trade system because it works along the lines that we want to have. And California's done a lot, so I'm proud of California and other states also. It's interesting that we had a, a uh, I, I don't remember numbers or anything right now, but we had a meeting at Hoover that uh, focused on how, what different states are doing. There's a lot going on at the state level, at the city level. And Mike Bloomberg is pushing cities. What can cities do? I think but Mike it's Bloomberg also is true that you can do a lot. And that's what is so interesting about this energy uh, efficiency thing. It, it affects, for instance, you remember it was, what was it, about 10 or 12 years ago, we had a big electricity crisis in California. And at the time I was working in San Francisco at a 23-story building Bechtel had. And we dimmed the lights in the corridors. We actually thought it was better this way. It was kind of glary before. And then it's a company where a lot of people travel. And they had a convention that secretaries came in and turned on all the lights. We said, if nobody's going to occupy an office, don't turn on the lights. And if somebody leaves, turn them off. That's all we did. Nobody invented anything. We saved 13% of our electricity bill. <laughs> and it, it, if, you, if people haven't been paying attention to a subject and they focus on it a little bit, it's amazing. The, difference you can make. And it adds up as this book look brings forward, out. I look forward to reading I think Mayor Bloomberg said that 70% of carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions are controlled in some way by the actions of cities uh, worldwide, which speaks to a lot of the potential there. Yeah. Yeah, he's working on the city issue hard. Yeah. Let's have a couple more questions. Uh, lady in the back there. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Secretary Schultz, for being here and for all of your service. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said that the carbon tax would apply to the energy sector. So do you see it being applied outside of the energy sector, so agricultural industry as well? Well, the tax would be on carbon from whatever oh, so source what it comes. And energy is one source, but there are lots of other sources. But it mainly is different ways of producing energy. And we, <clears throat> the tax would say, put them on a level playing field. The ones that don't produce any carbon, like solar, don't pay any tax. But the ones that do have to pay for the carbon they emit. It's a cost they impose on society, so it's just that they should carry that cost in competition. That's our argument. Thank you. Yeah. And let's take one more gentleman in the back there. Thank you. Yes, you're it. Oh, I'm just following up on that question. I don't need the uh, Just following up on that question, how do you tax the fleet of cars out there and trucks out there? I can't, I'm not hearing you well. Um, how do you tax the fleet of cars and trucks out there? You're talking about taxing sources of energy, whether it be agricultural or industrial or whatever. But there's a gigantic, obviously a huge fleet of cars and trucks and other sources of carbon. So how does the tax work mechanically for that? Well, our, our idea is to it'd be much more efficient to tax it pretty much at the source. So in the case of gasoline, tax it at the refinery level. It's a much more efficient way of doing it than raising the gas tax. At least that's our way of thinking about it. <clears throat> and then of course, uh, I would push the R&D. As I said earlier, I think the electric car has arrived. I mean, they, they now exist that take away the rings anxiety and the people that I know that I respect as knowing something about battery research say they're gonna get a lot better. So keep pushing on that. And pretty soon everybody will be saying, hey, 
Who needs gasoline? <laughs> right, very good. Well, I want to thank you for this excellent uh, sharing of your wisdom, your experience, and your uh, commitment to helping solve one of the most difficult problems our planet faces. Um, and we're just, again, so honored to have someone as distinguished as you sharing your thoughts and advice uh, with our Actera audience. And we hope to be working with you in other ways as you continue serving the country and the planet. Thank Go revenue neutral carbon tax. Thank you.